if you would all uh, wouldn't mind uh, taking seats, we're going to get started with the uh, next panel. I know it's confusing because I'm a familiar face from the previous panel <laughs> back to back, but uh, excited about this conversation we're going to do on uh, uh, higher ed redux. Can higher education bend the arc of human potential at scale? And uh, most of you won't know. This is a familiar cast of characters because we've had a conversation on a stage uh, before with this exact group. Uh, and we're reprising some of it, but we're going to dive deeper, I suspect, in certain themes in unexpected ways, right, John? I hope. Yeah, I, I ho hope so. <laughs> so, uh, all the way down, uh, we've got uh, John Katzman, the founder, CEO of the Noodle Companies. Uh, we have Andrew uh, Grauer, uh, Course Hero, Hero uh, CEO, and Suzanne Howard, uh, the founder and uh, dean of uh, IDOU, and then uh, Scott Pulsifer, the uh, president of uh, Western Governors University. And I'll. I'll I'll jump in sort of with a, a, a writ large conversa uh, question, and I, I suspect you're all going to jump in, and maybe uh, I'll, I'll uh, start to, with, with, with you, Andrew, if that's all right, pick on you first, um, which is as you look out, you know, we've had three days of conversations here about higher ed, innovation, and so forth, and there's a broader landscape outside of this world, obviously, unbeknownst to many in this world. Uh, what's most promising to you right now that you see uh, in innovation in higher education that gets you excited about the potential of bending that arc? So I think it's useful to think about things over different time horizons that will not change. And maybe just to start with this simple question, who in this room has had to study as a student in school? <laughs> Everybody. <laughs> who in school when studying, had many times a lot of difficulty while studying. Some people didn't raise their hands, and you are amazing people. <laughs> but when you find something that is a constant, you know, this is something that we all have to do that is frequently occurring in our lives. And when you're faced with it, it's a high magnitude stress problem. And that will not change over the next decade people will need to continue to learn and then prove they learned what they learned. And if that's the case, then I think focusing on how to do that better as technology changes is very compelling. And last time we chatted, the, the concept that I know at Coursera we believe in and when we're thinking about an in investment model or framework to, to build is aggregation theory. And so as we're lowering the cost of distribution, we're increasing access for students, tutors, educators, institutions to reach that distribution channel at a low cost, then I think one of the most exciting things that will be happening over the next five and 10 years is that more flexibly and affordably, we can give great access to great teachers and great learning and teaching resources. And that's something that I think is a high likelihood to happen in really exciting ways over the next five and 10 years. Who wants to jump in next? Promising. I can jump in. Yeah. So I think one of the things, I'm just looking around this room and seeing people that I've met over the last few days, and I am blown away at the variety of content that's coming from so many diverse places. I think we know we're excited about what IDEO is putting out into the world. We know that we're excited what other corporations are putting out into the world from the GEs and the IBMs and the Googles. And we know that there is a huge appetite to learn from certain kinds of corporations that are doing things differently and that other people aspire to adopt and absorb those behaviors. But in the last few days, I've met people from Tegelf in India who are teaching leadership in the style of Gandhi and people from Course Hero who are teaching coding to level the playing field for all sorts of practitioners in the world of code and people from Acumen Foundation. So I'm just amazed at the moment in the innovation cycle that we happen to be in, where we see this wealth of content coming from amazing instructors who have quality things to teach. And I think the reason there's so much hunger is because there is a bit of a gap right now between what's going on in higher ed and the needs in the workplace. And so I think what we're seeing are different players coming up to fill in this gap in all sorts of fascinating ways. What's exciting to me is we have the potential right now to dramatically lower the cost of higher ed at the moment where we're going to need more of it, that more people are going to be educated in more countries, that they're going to need life learning. Um, it couldn't come at a better time. And the 
the over-under for me is that student faculty engagement and the community of students, how you learn collaboratively and your engagement with faculty, is stuff that, that every single time Gallup or anybody else looks to see what are the things that correlate to life success in a variety of ways, um, that, that engagement is critical. Getting that engagement at lower cost is, is what we can do, and I, and, I, and I sort of see it happening. Yeah, I would. Uh, um, I totally agree with that one. I do think that uh, w we are going to dramatically reduce the cost of uh, delivering education and accessing education. But I think what I'm most, uh, what I find most promising, is the personalization of that learning journey and the ability to leverage, you know, very individualized content, individualized faculty models, individualized delivering consumption models that that dramatically expands access, especially for the disadvantaged and underserved. And we'll, we'll shift from a model I think is very much a standard model, and if, if you take everyone into that, those who do well in it get A's and B's, those who struggle get C's, and then many stop out and aren't successful. Um, and that's not the model I think will be of the future. I think the future model is definitely shifting towards everyone has the in, you know, capacity for learning, and it's the job of the you know, providers of that learning and those learning pathways to figure out how to help that individual be successful so that everyone can ultimately achieve a path to opportunity. So I'll ask the flip side of the question, and maybe I'll start with you, John, because you're on the edge of your seat, uh, which is what's most worrisome to you as you're looking out there right now and, and hearing all the uh, talk of innovation and so forth? Well, you know, in a sense, I, I was leaning forward uh, because Scott's comment is a, is a jumping off point for me for Go one for of it. those dangers. Personalized learning is great to a point. And if you think about how you balance your personal journey and, and adaptive uh, education with collaboration and a social component of learning, um, it's really hard. And I haven't seen it done well in just about any place. Um, and which do we give up? If, if we have to be a little bit more standardized, this course you're going to take at the pace that everybody else is taking the course, or you have to be on your own you know, kind of learning as if you were just reading a book, uh, maybe a high-tech version of that, uh, which, one, which one would we go for? And I'm not saying we have to choose, but when we do have to choose, which way do we go? Well, I think we overestimate the social component of learning, um, meaning that a lecture to a hall of six to 800 students is not social. Um, I think most of the learning may happen in study groups that can easily be replicated online. Uh, it happens in one-on-one -on -one sessions with tutors or with faculty. Um, I think the notion of the social component of learning is, in fact, uh, overestimated as what occurs in a traditional model of education. So I think some of the challenges, though, to your question are, are, are we really focused on measuring the impact on students? Innovation without impact is an innovation. It's just bad ideas. Um, and then we have plenty of ideas that are propagating technologies, new process models, new delivery models, et cetera. But I don't see many of them really truly uh, evaluating whether those are being successful for the students that they're serving. That, many would like to focus mo mostly on access. Like that's one worry that I have is that we'll talk a lot about how we can expand the enrollment and everything else, but they won't talk about how many actually progress, persist, attain, complete, and actually transition to opportunities and jobs. And so my worry is that we won't hold ourselves accountable to actually having the impact we, that we purport to want to have. So. Just to be clear, you can't take the worst part of education, which is a lecture, and make that the high bar for what we're doing. Right, yeah, that's what I often joke about the fact a lecture in an online context, it's just content. Um, and yet, it's considered substantive interaction in a, in a live or a physical context. And it's said, well, you know, it's, and that, that may be true, but I think of even my own experience of learning, um, everyone does this because most of us went to college. Um, that the learning, the lecture is not where the learning occurred. It's where you consumed content. Um, I think also I realized that uh, I was already pursuing a personalized pathway because I spent time where I had to struggle and had to really work and find my peer groups of learning, study groups, et cetera, engage with faculty. And I never spent time on the ones I can learn at my own pace and accelerate through them, et cetera. And yet I had to wait around to take the final. 
And so I think we already ourselves are finding that we do our own personalized learning journeys. It's just that the institution didn't let us do it. And if we can personalize our own pathways, we'll figure out how to, institutions will figure out how to do that so that we can actually traverse the way that we are already doing ourselves, but the institutions haven't adapted to it. So. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that I get a little bit concerned about, I, I love traditional education. I think so many of us benefited from a traditional way forward, but I think there are just some barriers between the institutions to collaborate and find ways that we can bring these worlds together. I think we're seeing definitely some innovations that aren't well proven, but I think we don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater there either. There are so many things that are being well measured, well tracked, tracking all sorts of interesting approaches forward. I think we've seen some amazing things in coaching at this conference that are versions of social learning that are fascinating and that are just coming into force in our learning landscape. And so how do we break down the barriers between corporations and for-profit learning institutions and higher ed institutions so that we can truly partner and change the size and shape and pace of learning experiences so that they can fit more people, a greater variety of learning styles, and also later stages in life so that we're not packing it all into those four supposed years where we learn all that we need to do, but we're extending it and making a drumbeat available all life long. I think understanding some of the why or the context for why is it important to struggle with this balance between what's personalized versus what's traditional and why is access more and more important, why is flexibility more and more important, is over the next five and ten years and even starting today, what's not necessarily understood is the face of students in higher ed is dramatically different than what one would assume. So today, about 40% of the 20 million students in the US in post-secondary education are working 30 hours or more per week while they're studying full-time. And actually, about 25% of all students are parents. So you have a state where you are a parent, you are raising children, 70% of whom are actually single moms, while going to school full-time. Think of that, that's not necessarily that traditional 18 to 24 year old student that we think of as, as the majority of students in US college. And understanding that when you look at different surveys today, uh, the majority of students are reporting that they're incredibly stressed and anxious. And figuring out how to come up with solutions and coming up with the right solutions is a struggle because it's not obvious. What are the technological innovations? What are the service innovations? What should be blended or not? I think that's, this context is why it is so important to actually run at this problem and come up and experiment with new models, even though many of them might, might not be the ultimate solutions. And then on top of that, how do we measure what good looks like and what quality is? I think there are lots of amazing conversations here over the last few days about how do we assess quality learning, especially when they might not be the kinds of skills that are easier to measure, especially in an online environment. How do you see what good looks like? How do you validate that certain people are moving forward in those kinds of capabilities? So how do you each think about actually this quality question? Because, I mean, John, something you always point out is there's short-term measures and there are long-term measures, and unfortunately the certainty is actually reversed of what we might want in, the, in, in those two. Yeah, almost anything we can measure in the short term doesn't matter. Um, you know, <coughs> and we think, we think, it is predictive of long-term things that do matter. And there's very often no evidence, uh, no data around that, and no effort to get that data. So, so you've got both in K-12 and in higher ed, an awful lot of energy being spent measuring learning outcomes that, you know, that, that leave everybody just kind of shrugging. The long-term measures, people who go to this school or take this program end up one year, five year, 10 year, 15 years out, um, employed in jobs that they like, at reasonable wages, or they're happy as humans, they're good members of society. Um, those are measurable things that we generally don't measure and tie back to the learning itself. And I think we have an opportunity to do that, an opportunity to look at short term, to look at long term, to correlate, to continue to iterate on that because any short term measure is gonna get gamed and so it will become less predictive of real outcomes. Um, and, and we are 
right at the cusp of having the kind of big data uh, sets uh, that, that could actually help steer education in a good place. Yeah, I totally agree with, his, with your long-term data point because it's even really difficult to isolate whether it was the learning or the individual too, which ones had the more causal relationship with those long-term benefits. We do know that, uh, that the learning pathways, especially those that provide the social capital that's needed to have the network of access to opportunities for individuals to actually have a lifelong kind of provident you know, access to opportunity, like that's really, uh, that's unavailable to many individuals today who are not being served by the pathways of higher education. And so that is certainly one thing that is a great outcome of the education at post-secondary level is the social capital that comes with that that shows that you can demonstrate you have the capacity for learning, that you have the capacity for reasoning and communication and interpersonal engagement, et cetera. Those have very lifelong benefits that are hard to build in other contexts. There's no doubt about that. Um, having said that, I do think that there are ways to actually focus on certain short-term measures that you can increase the probability that individuals are successful in attaining those kind of key measured outcomes that lead to a lifelong. Uh, we do look at things at WGU, for example, like. Uh, course completion rates and on-time course completion rates. We do look at overall engagement rates. We also look at those because they are very predictive factors as to whether on a term will a student actually be achieving on-time progress at a term. We also know that those that are achieving on-time progress at a term that they are more than 90% likely to persist term to term versus those who don't achieve OTP are more like 56 something, 56, 57%, meaning that you're likely to stop out. And so we do know that what are those critical factors that lead to persistence? And persistence is the most important contributor or indicator of attainment. And that if you attain something that we know at least you're on a path, or a path to achieving the long-term benefit of education. Um, otherwise, we have uh, a notion at WGU is like given 70% of our students are taking financial aid, et cetera. If they don't uh, persist and complete, then they're worse off than had they never started because they've taken on debt now, they're no better prepared for the opportunities and work that they, that they need to have in their life to, to better it, to increase their social mobility. And so they're worse off had they never, than had they never started. And so we do obsess around a lot of kind of key short-term measures for us that increase the probability that ultimately they'll achieve the milestone and attainment because we know then at least there'll be a path to the long term. Before yeah. you jump in, I just want to make one point. So I, it, when you're talking about those short-term measures, those are things you focus on as an institution to improve your long-term outcomes, not things that society is ranking you on and therefore you would game. I just want to write. Correct. Like we, we, we have very much taken, given that we are entirely technology enabled from end to end on a student journey, we have so much information that's our inputs that we can analyze to identify those that have strong causal or correlated relationships with the key outcome measures of the learning journey, the key outcome measure being graduation. And so uh, we know that graduation rates are the single most important outcome for the learning journey that we have the most controllable inputs on. Having said that, we also measure through surveys, through other data, et cetera, all of the graduate outcomes too for, our, for the individuals who go through our programs because we also wanna measure whether we developed quality curriculum that's aligned with the opportunity, whether we provided a pathway and a model that supports that individual's development of overall well-being, that put them on a path for social mobility, et cetera. We actually want to measure all those things so that we know that ultimately the investment was worth it, that the return actually made the investment worth it. Um, you know, that's the ROI on that has to be true. Otherwise, it becomes very hard for as students, as consumers of higher ed, to continue to make that investment. If the cost of investment keeps going up, but in fact there's no measured return on that, then why would I invest you know, $250,000 to go get a degree when I could go invest you know, $12,000 to $25,000 to get a more aligned you know, a credential to an opportunity that gives me the same you know, outcome or a better outcome? Yeah. So. I think in some ways a lot of our short-term metrics are very similar to WGU, but then the long-term metrics are a little bit different, and that's because we're... We're educating people who are going straight back into the workplace, not right into educational institutions. So short term, we look at all sorts of things, completion rates, engagement rates, net promoter scores, satisfaction. Are people changing behaviors during the course? It's project based so we can assess the quality of their work inside of the course. And then afterwards we do still short term assessments six months, a year afterwards. 
is this is what they learned actually impacting their work and changing their work outputs but what's really interesting is when we have teams inside of larger organizations taking our courses together because then that institution that corporation is running their own assessment and gathering their own metrics and they're certainly not going to pay us and come back to study with us again if we don't have positive impacts on the work that their people are doing inside of their own organization so they are looking at how did this impact their work? Are we seeing a rise in innovation? And then at IDEO, outside of IDEOU, we also do have a creativity and innovation assessment tool. It works at the organizational level, not at the individual level, so it's a little bit harder to game, something called creative difference. And so teams can take this assessment to see have they actually moved the capability further forward? And then we're starting to see if people take our courses, do we see any impacts on those larger assessments as well? So that's the long-term things that we're looking at. And I think there's still plenty of work to do in figuring out how we can assess these things longer term. But in a workplace and maybe in a larger community of learners out in the world, you can retain that community and track and measure and look at the impacts on their work and the career outcomes that they might have over time. Andrew, do you have a... Well, I think what we're discussing here is trying to measure what matters and looking at it in the short term and the long term. And I think, Scott, what you were saying about uh, measuring one metric in particular, which is did you persist and did you churn or did you graduate after matriculation? And what we know is that within uh, six years of matriculating, 40% or so of all students in college in the US do not graduate. So at a minimum, you could think of the fact that uh, zeros kill averages. And there's a massive opportunity cost to investing time, money, your reputation, a lot of things for two years, four years, six years to not then graduate when you expected to do so. What a terrible outcome. So at a minimum, solving that problem objectively, that metric, would be very valuable. Then on a longer term basis, trying to track what would be the career outcomes, what was your goal, what was your dream, what was your hope in trying to enroll and then ultimately graduate to some next step, some next outcome in a set of steps to multiple outcomes. I think that's really compelling as well um, over a longer term because uh, yes, we're gonna be able to track big data, but also what's happening is that technology is impacting our economies, our politics, our personal daily lives at a rate and a magnitude that we have never seen before in human history. And what that is causing us all to do is have to figure out how do we, how do we learn more and faster over and over and over throughout longer periods of time in our life, not just K through 12, K through higher ed, college, grad school, but then in our, in our professional lives. Um. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm really struggling with retention as an important metric. It is, you know, on the one hand, you've got the Corinthians and the terrible schools that had 3% graduation rates, and they truly were doing all the bad things you're talking about here. On the other hand, I look at some community colleges who a lot of students are there simply to get a job, right? And the second that they get the job, they're gone, and they don't feel bad they gained the skills necessary, they got them to a certain point, and maybe they'll come back when they want to get a different job. But somehow we've got to be more subtle about what is the point of this program, what is the point of it for this student, um, if, we're, if we're really going to have a thoughtful conversation or a thoughtful policy. Well, um, you definitely can't measure the outcomes for all students the same, because to your point, it's like course-taking students are very different than credential-seeking students. Uh, even a credential-seeking student is very different than a degree-seeking student. A credential being a micro-credential, you know, micro like a certificate or some other uh, sub-degree credential. But there are still attainment of the learning that ultimately maps then to an opportunity. And so the individuals have probably self-selected that. So if I came and took the courses and acquired the skills I needed to get the job, that was a successful outcome for them. But the institution has no way of measuring that. Right. And so I think that th there are better ways to do that. I mean, we know today that our key outcomes We've integrated many of the micro-credentials ultimately into the degree, but we've at least put ourselves in a position to where having designed at a competency level, 
You can also identify the better maps between the competencies acquired to the opportunities that exist. So you can then start measuring the attainment of those competencies to the opportunity. If we can do that, then you can measure the attainment of that the same as you can measure attainment of a degree. Um, and we have to be able to do that for all types of learners. Uh, one thing that is very uh, much easier for WGU is though, is that we have only full-time degree-seeking students. We don't have any course-taking students. We don't allow it, you know, meaning our current model is not designed that way. You have to be in a, enrolled in a program from day one. So we have a very different profile of students such that the attainment measures for us are very simple and retention then becomes a very key measure. But until you can be able to identify at a very uh, you know, unbundled unit level of this acquired learning maps this opportunity, then the attainment of this has to link to the attainment of that, and you have to connect those as an ROI. Um, the other thing I'd say to Andrew, to your point, is graduation rate you also have to be careful with because if you only focus on that one, you won't solve the problem because everyone realizes the problem has really happened in the first and second terms. Like, you, you have to be able to get them on a pathway to, that they can persist through those first couple terms because if they aren't, then that's where most of your dropouts and stopouts are occurring. If you can get through, we kind of look at that 13-month retention measure, we know from that point, you're pretty much at 85-90% certainty that you're going to complete. It's kind of like crossing the Atlantic. Once you're halfway there, it's easier to complete than stopping out. Um, but you do see things happening, like John said, too. Is like we have people in our uh, technology programs, as soon as they acquire certain certifications or integrated our programs, ah, that's all I needed. This was the cheapest way to get it. I went and got my job because now I'm a NSA, nice, whatever, certified cybersecurity uh, developer. I don't need the cybersecurity bachelor's degree. Uh, that happens too, and, and we don't have currently a way to track that. That's I, going on. I think what's fascinating is the fact that if we put a design lens on this, we can figure out what are those unique needs, what are the different situations. We know that a four-year degree is not solving for them. We know that community colleges, and we know it's not always about the end goal of that graduation. But what are the other unique learning experiences that we need in the world? So I think there is something. I know there's a plethora and excess of micro-credentials and badges and a few too many of those things going on right now. But they're serving a need, which is something that's longer than a YouTube video length of learning and a little bit shorter than maybe an exec ed program or a semester's length of learning. So what are these needs? And then how do we design educational experiences that have the right incentives, the right motivators, the right size and shape and pacing so that they can fit those unique moments. And some of that will solve and help more people get through a higher ed institution, and then some of that will just serve people in other parts of But do of you think life. you have to be careful? Uh, graduation rate may not be the right way to think about it. It should be attainment rate, mm -hmm. because that is ultimately what the, in, the student is actually paying to acquire. Now, if that, that unit that they're trying to acquire is really small, you still have to measure the attainment of that and how much did it cost and what was ultimately the return on that investment that that individual's made, especially if you want the federal government to underwrite it, by the way, because I, as a taxpayer, don't want to underwrite things that, in fact, are not leading to outcomes. There is no ROI on that investment, even as a public good. And so whatever that attainment rate is for whatever is being pursued, that is a key measure because having attained that, that's the thing that leads to the opportunity then you have the ability to kind of measure an ROI. If there is no ability to measure ROI, I would not want to be underwriting that for anybody. So I've been watching the growth of certificate programs and credentials of one sort or another, and the exponential growth in the number of programs, not so much in the number of students taking those programs. And, and the, the growth of people actually getting certificates is, is not great. Um, there are a couple areas in tech, and that's, and that's about it. And you look at it, we all know what a BA is. There are different flavors at different schools. We know what an MBA is. We know what a, a nursing uh, degree is. And because we know what it is, uh, we can pack it into our job descriptions, and we can reward people uh, uh, for those degrees. The certificates, on the other hand, they all look kind of alike. And this one was three hours over a weekend, and this one was 12 credits, and, and it's, it's a mess. And employers are having a hard time incorporating that into anything, and therefore the value of those credentials is very often uh, uh, minimal. Uh, as Scott and I were talking about the notion of creating a, let's imagine, something in between a bachelor's and a master's, uh, a, a specialist, 12 credits, the universities that decide to give it 
can agree on what the competencies are that those programs would do. They can agree that these are stackable towards their masters. So you get your certificate, you get your specialist degree over here, but you can use it to finish your masters over here. Um, creating a clean, intelligent pipe with meaningful degrees, meaningful credentials, I think, uh, is, is a way station to getting kind of where you want to go here. I think there are other ways, too. I mean, I think that's very interesting and something that's amazing to support. But I'm also listening to so many of the conversations about the larger skills map and the gap in needs and the fact that there are still some skills out there that are highly in demand in the workforce that we're not great at teaching just yet. So a lot of those things that we choose to focus on are the softer skills, the power skills that they talk about a lot at um, WGU, the human skills that um, uh, Burning Glass are talking about. How do we teach some of the things that are highly in demand, like navigating ambiguity, like being strong innovators in the workforce, like collaborating across an extraordinary amount of diversity in order to get new and innovative ideas out there? How do we teach people how to be powerful communicators? And so I think we can do that through university institutions, but it's not the only place. And so if we can work with others who are building common skills maps, who are figuring out, I'm fascinated with organizations like Degree that are looking at ways we can assess these competencies and see if people are building some of these softer skills that are a little bit harder to measure. So I think we can do it through university and higher ed ecosystems, but we can also do it through workplace ecosystems at the same time. Yeah, I think there are two different uh, points there. Um, one thing that I, we believe heavily is that uh, what John, you raised is a huge problem and probably one that we should have raised to your early question, which is certificates or non-degree credentials have proliferated at a rate that uh, uh, they're somewhat like, I jokingly, they're like mutual funds, which is there are more mutual funds listed for purchase than there are underlying stocks that make up those mutual funds. So it's harder to actually pick the funds than it is to pick the individual companies that you'd want to invest in. Certificates are somewhat like that. But they're worse still, which is no one actually has any long-term assessed value of those certificates yet. The employers and recruiters don't know how to value them and assess them. There's certain cases where there are pockets of the examples, I would say, there are definitely postgraduate certificates in teaching that have very clear value associated with them. A good example would be you can be a STEM certified teacher in K-12 for CS in every school, having already having your teaching degree and your license, but you can then go acquire a STEM certification uh, for teaching uh, uh, technology in particular. that have very clear value associated with them, meaning school districts and schools are willing to pay up for those that have those. However, now you have all these alternative providers and institutions that are already accredited now wanting to propagate these other certificates, but the individuals who are supposed to consume them have no idea yet whether there's any value in the marketplace because recruiting managers don't know what they mean or how to assess you know, the, whether the candidates come in with the competencies and skills that are needed, et cetera. Um, so that's a real problem. And I think the second problem to that that I worry about a ton is that there's no portability of that learning into any other learning roadmap, meaning that we as an institution would not likely attach credit to any of those certificates that are provided by some of the, the coding boot camps, et cetera. And yet the individual who has them wants all that transferability and portability. They want to be able to have it stack. Otherwise, I just have to start over again if I want to pursue the next you know, stackable credential of, or the next credential. That's really, really hard. And if we don't fix it, it's going to be more expensive over time for that individual to achieve a rank of a bachelor's, if you will, than it would be if we made it to where those learning units are fully transferable and stackable ultimately into a degree that you may take 10 plus years to acquire, but you've done it through truly certified learning that's provided sometimes by an institution, sometimes by an alternative provider, et cetera. But whatever I'm acquiring, it always has opportunity attached to it. And it's truly understood and valued Otherwise, you get really enterprising for-profit entities out there you know, selling their goods without any measured return on it. And that'll work for some time, but it falls over once the consumers of those start to realize like it wasn't worth the investment. The I employers think don't understand so it. So many of us were just getting started. And so I think there are so many of us listening to the marketplace, designing curriculum that can help to fill a need. Sometimes that's not translating 
it particularly well, and we're trying to speak the language of recruiters, speak the language of the learners, speak the language of the business, so that we're expressing to people what it is that this educational experience, what is the gap that it's going to fill. And then on the portability, I think so many of us are starting to collaborate but with there, higher ed institutions to get but there's credits for potentially massive waste in there. There um, is especially potentially. when I consider some of the credentials that are being offered costs more than acquiring a bachelor's degree at a community college or a college that offers a bachelor's degree. You're like when it would cost you a one year or two year program can cost upwards of twenty five to fifty thousand dollars. And you're like, but you could go acquire a bachelor's degree that's still understood. A BA is still understood because it still represents that you've demonstrated capacity for these particular things and that's what I want first. But those skills based things, it's hard to know whether they have value and yet they want to charge an individual student upwards of twenty five thousand dollars plus to acquire it. Yeah, I think there are some people it's who are really, definitely really gouging, but there are also lots of organizations that are trying to use these mechanisms to make education scalable and accessible so just as I, your institutions are. So I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna jump in and move us to the last question. I love this panel because I don't have to ask many questions. <laughs> uh, which uh, last question with the time remaining. What's missing from the innovation out there? What do, you, what do you wish you saw that is just not there, that is not going to get us to this point of uh, If of, I knew of the answer to that question, what would we be doing? You'd, you'd be doing it. All right, fine. <laughs> so, but but you yeah. know, you're, all, you're all constrained in certain yeah. ways. What do you wish innovators were doing? Or, or what do you wish Scott, uh, Western Governors was doing? <laughs> no, yeah. Um, the, uh, I don't know. I was just thinking about uh, the, it, it, the trick is asking the question. Uh, there's two different ways to ask a question and get the same outcome, which is how do students learn versus how do we teach? Mm. They do solve for different things. Um, uh, for example, um, I do think we have not solved for how individuals learn in a variety of different contexts, particularly related to some of these power skills. I think it's we'll go down the wrong innovation roadmap. We try to figure out how to teach power skills versus how do individuals acquire and develop power skills like communication, like interpersonal engagement, like dealing with ambiguity, et cetera, like the ones you mentioned? And I think if you start solving for the, how do individuals learn for that and then provide all the rich tools and content and faculty engagement or non-faculty engagement, mean work project-based engagement, et cetera, that I think will start to uh, help individuals develop their uh, human capital in a way that we've heretofore not been able to do. So that's one thing that I think that I think about a lot. Yeah, I, I think about um, less fighting, more collaboration, less throwing the baby out with the bathwater, and more finding the really good innovative solutions and creating partnerships so that we can learn from each other and really add firepower to this innovation ecosystem. I think there are innovators outside of higher ed who are pushing the boundaries, especially around size, shape, pace, the design of the motivations, the incentives in learning experiences, and I think like true deep partnerships and learning together across the boundaries. I see some of our partners at Boise State School of Innovation and Design right over there, and we've had amazing partnerships with innovative institutions who are willing to reach across the boundaries and start to collaborate together to blend the best, not only of online and face-to-face, -face, but also of for-profit institutions, not-for-profit institutions, and higher ed institutions. Look, I think this is a great conversation to be having, and clearly, it's almost the, the flip of what you're talking about. What, what is exciting from an innovation standpoint? I think what we're pointing out is there is a proliferation of so many innovative approaches that there's uh, a problem in the messiness that is created and the wastage that is created in the innovation. And uh, the pragmatic reality, if we're going to have a, a general path towards micro-credentialing, unbundling, and new certificates or signals that are being provided, is that then, do these signals matter? And if I invest my time, if I invest my money, will it actually be valued by uh, anybody that I was hoping it to be valued by? And that's, that's, that's a real issue. And so that's where one wants to have a sense of standardization uh, and more of an understanding that let's do fewer things and fewer programs and invest more into them. And I think that's what this conversation is about because we are trying to innovate and we see that uh, as, as we're doing this execution. Um, I think any given metric that we talked about, outcomes, career outcomes, down to then attainment, down to graduation rate, 
and then as you said, maybe even just 12 months or 13 months in to persistence versus churn, to NPS or engagement, even down to an assessment level. Like th these metrics all matter, and you can't just find one metric. And even in any one metric, the people involved have to care about the intent of what it's trying to accomplish. And ultimately, the bets then have to be made on what do we want to do to move those metrics. And I think there's a lot of exciting things. If I were to make one bet on the teaching side, I think what is incredibly impactful in probably each of our lives, we could count on one hand the number of teachers that we truly remember that made a huge impact in our lives. And I think if we can create more access to those people from more people around the world, I think high probability that will have a really positive impact on a lot of people. So John, uh, you've been in this space longer than all of us. Uh, last word on what's missing that you'd like to see in, the, uh, in, in this conversation. You know, transparency is a really broad term. And I, I think that in two axes. The first one is, how is the school spending your money? What are you spending? What are the outcomes? And where did that money go? There are schools that are spending, four-year undergraduate institutions, spending $3,000 a year on teaching, and their schools spending $30,000 a year on teaching. Just that component. Um, students should understand where their money's going. And then the second form of transparency is what Andrew was talking about. Um, how do we measure things in a smarter way to look at actual outcomes that matter, to look longitudinally, and, and run a controlled experiment rather than just a, a kind of spasmodic series of, 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 random, of, of random innovations? Perfect. Uh, will you join me in uh, thanking these uh, panelists in this conversation? Thank you.